So our next speaker today is none other than the Reverend Dr. Anne Solari. Anne is an incredible woman who, alongside being a deacon at St. John's Anglican Cathedral in Brisbane, works mainly as a general practitioner for vulnerable communities, including the people experiencing homelessness in, gen in central Brisbane. Incredible, right? When I first heard about Anne's story, the biggest thing that stuck with me was that Anne chose to work out on the streets with the most susceptible people rather than work full time at a medical facility where she could be earning a stable and higher income. So what drives her to be potentially disadvantaging herself? Is it really a disadvantage? What insight did she have that I just simply wasn't getting? So with that said, I'd like to welcome up Anne to share with us her life experiences. Thank you for the introduction. Hello everyone. I would not feel in any way that I was disadvantaged. I'm actually really lucky. I've got a beautiful family, I live in a fabulous place, and I can do fairly much whatever I want within limits, COVID being the biggest limit at the moment, of course. I was born in London. My father was the as a first generation refugee family from Italy who moved to London. My grandfather actually walked from Italy through Switzerland and France to London in the Great Depression. My family lived in the suburbs of London. My dad had a very well-paying job. He didn't go to uni because he was conscripted at the end of the Second World War. And when he got back from Germany, he didn't want to go to uni and he started in the banks. I have four younger siblings. I went to a grammar school in a very nice suburb and had all the advantages that a middle-class white girl would expect. My childhood wasn't desperately happy. We had a very strict, abusive upbringing in many ways, but life was okay. When I was 18, I had a place to go to university to do maths, but chose instead to go nursing. Because for me, I wanted to leave home, and leaving home meant being independent. So I went to Bart's Hospital, and I trained as a registered nurse. And at the end of my training, I started working on the kids' cancer ward. And I worked there as a trained nurse for a couple of years before realising that I wasn't desperately satisfied in what I was doing, because I actually knew more about what we should be doing than the doctors coming through. Um, and that was simply experience. They were there for three to six months. I'd been there for two years by that stage. So I went to university and trained as a doctor. At the end of my training, I was living in the southwest of England. I had been sent to a church as a child. I'd gone to a Baptist church. Uh, when I left home, I had left the Baptist church. I believed that I was being taught that God sent his only son to be killed. And I couldn't actually believe in a God that would kill anybody. I actually had this feeling inside me that we all matter. There's something special about each of us and that we should actually be doing the best for each other and that killing people wasn't part of the big scheme of things in my brain. And that calling is what's told me that I needed to go and look after people. So I became a nurse, then a doctor. Then when I started medicine, I had started going to a Roman Catholic church in Bristol. And as I got to the end of my training, I was having this call to do something. And it felt to me as if I was being called to become a leader in the Roman Catholic church. And the problem for women in the Roman Catholic church is that leaders tend to be male and if you're a woman and you're a doctor, you can be a nun or a missionary. And for most people who know me will know that probably deep, dark African jungles are actually not my thing. I love walking, but Tuscany is my place. <laughs> <laughs> and to be a nun really didn't actually fit with my aspiration to have a large family. So after I had worked for a couple of years and started my training to become a paediatric oncologist, I actually decided to run away from God because God wouldn't leave me alone in England. So I ended up in Australia where I got pregnant, got married, had kids in a small place called Grafton and actually lived there for 20 years. I couldn't do paediatric cancer services in Grafton because I couldn't do my training there. 
And having kids, I didn't really want to leave them behind. So I became a GP. Now, the interesting thing for me is that I grew up in the UK where you don't pay to go to the doctor. And I had great trouble trying to make people pay to come and see me as a GP. So I ended up bulk billing everyone. So I ended up looking after not the nice middle class people like me. I ended up looking after the people who couldn't afford to go to the doctor. So I ended up looking after most of the drug addicts in Grafton, the single women, the homeless people. And in the end, the practice that I was working at decided there really wasn't a place for my methadone-taking patients, because I was the only methadone prescriber in the valley, to be in their nice surgery. So they supported me to move to Grafton Cathedral and use one of the cottages there and go out by myself. So for most, so for 10 years, I worked as a GP looking after people on the edge from Grafton Cathedral, from a cottage. And halfway through that time, I actually became ordained as a clergy person because I'm a deacon. I'm actually the Reverend Dr. Anne Solari, which means I'm a church leader, even though a lot of people don't realize that most, a lot of my patients on the street have no idea what I do in my spare time. About 12, 13 years ago, we got to a stage in life that my two eldest kids were living in Brisbane. Rhiannon, who is my third child, had finished just done year 12 and she was going to come to UQ trying to start to do medicine. She's the only one who's followed in my footsteps at all. And she, wants to, she doesn't want to be a homeless doctor, she tells me. <laughs> um, and my younger daughter was ready to go into year 11 and her best friend's family had moved up to Brisbane the year before. So we made the decision as a family um, that we would come to Brisbane. And so I moved my job as a clergy person from Grafton Cathedral to Brisbane Cathedral. And I started working in a general practice on the south side. I decided to go back to normal general practice because my kids thought that would be much nicer for them. You know, they were in a big city if I worked regular hours and knew nice people. That didn't work. It was an absolute failure. I'm not very good at sitting in a surgery trying to make money for somebody by seeing six people an hour. I like to listen to people and I like to do my own thing. So that didn't last for very long and I ended up doing what I'd done in Grafton, but not from a cottage in the cathedral grounds. I was living in the, in the building in the cathedral grounds as the cathedral deacon, but I started going out with the different organisations that work within the homeless sector in Brisbane. So I started going to several of the homeless shelters. So most days my life started at about 7.30 in the morning when I would go to one of the shelters and see people there as their GP. I would then move to one of the resource centres or one of the other shelters or go out with the drug on bus seeing people on the streets or with the Anglican nurses at various places. And for the last 10, 11 years, that's what I've been doing. My life cycle has been moving from place to place with my office in a bag, looking after the people that I think I'm actually called to look after. It's not what I ever saw myself doing. It's not what... I realised I was called to do, but I actually love listening to people. I hate paperwork, but I love listening to people's stories. I love trying to solve problems. I like just being there with people, trying to meet their needs, which is what I do. I also do a horrendous amount of paperwork because the most valuable thing a doctor has is their signature. So I do forms for Centrelink, I do forms for housing, I do forms for anything you can possibly imagine. But I know that I make a difference to some of these people because I work with people who feel hopeless. When you're a drag drug addict, when you're a rough sleeper, when you're someone who has got nowhere to go, who knows they're going to lose the poor housing they've got, who's been abused by other people all their life, they actually get to a stage where they can't see any hope for the future, which is why so many of them drink alcohol and use drugs. And those of us who go in actually have to take the hope into their lives with us. 
we're the ones who can listen to the story and validate the experience, but validate that they're a real person and that they can do something. And there is some hope in the future. We can't promise them a nice house. We can't promise them a job, but we can promise them that they're special and they do matter. And I'm privileged to share that with them. I'm also fortunate in Australia that nearly everybody who's homeless has a Medicare number. So I can actually get paid for doing that, which is why I'm not disadvantaged. Yes, I don't own huge wages. And yes, I get exhausted after listening to 15 to 20 people's stories a day. So I'm not earning big bucks. But I'm actually advantaged because I know I'm actually doing something that's valued. At the moment, COVID has made a huge difference to our sector because for the first time in living memory, we've actually had a huge percentage of people in Brisbane housed. What happened during the lockdown was that it became illegal to sleep in public places. You'd, one stage during the lockdown, you weren't even allowed to sit in a park. I'm sure you can remember that last year. We were only allowed to walk through them. So what the initially the Department of Health and then Department of Housing took over and everybody who was sleeping rough was actually offered a room in a hotel because the hotels had rooms and no people because there's no tourists. And every single lockdown since, the same thing has happened. The really good thing about that was not only did they get to sleep in a room and get fed, so their physical health actually improved, the ones who actually worked with the welfare workers and worked with Department of Housing were actually all offered housing as well. So we've had a lot of people, even if it's only been short periods, have actually been in reasonable accommodation. And we've had a lot of people, particularly middle-aged men who've been waiting 12, 13 years for housing, have suddenly got their housing because the Department of Housing has done miracles and has found rooms and apartments and flats. And instead of refurbishing them, have let people move straight into them. So our life feels reasonably good at the moment, even though we're really worried about what COVID is going to do if it gets into the homeless population. So from many points of views, I'm in a really good space. You know, I enjoy what I do. Not every day, sometimes I hate it. I hate paperwork, I hate forms, and I have plenty of paperwork and forms to do. But that's part of life in our society, and it actually benefits people. So there is a positive to actually doing stuff you dislike some of the time. The other thing I'm involved with is the cathedral. So I'm one of the clergy people at the cathedral, and one of the big programs I look after is our Rough Sleepers program. So we let rough sleepers sleep on site. And because it's private property, they could still sleep on site during lockdowns. So we let them sleep on, in the cathedral grounds, not in the cathedral itself, between six, and six at night and six in the morning. So the cathedral bells ring at six and six. They ring something called the Angelus every day. Actually rings at midday as well. But at six o'clock in the morning, that's the sign that I have to go out and wait, wake everybody up who's still asleep and say, can you just move on to the coffee vans now, please? Because the first van the, will be at Ivory Street between 6 and 6.30 for breakfast. But I get the job of waking people up, folding the blankets up, hiding them in the cathedral. Then 6 o'clock at night, or whenever I get home, if it's later, we do the reverse thing. The bells ring, and then I go and open the doors, and if anybody's there, they help me get the blankets out. And we put out food and toiletries and old, and good, clean old clothes if we've got them. Um, our program has actually taken over the bottom corridor of the ca in the cathedral offices. We have so many bags with blankets and towels and stuff coming in that we process fairly quickly, but it looks a bit like an op shop at times, most of the time, as I'm sure those of you who visited the cathedral offices will notice. My corridor is spilled out halfway down. So... Homeless people are part of my life. They're part of our life at the cathedral. We know we've had, we've had three guys who've been sleeping there since the beginning of COVID. Okay, it's their home. And we don't know if or when they will ever move. And they are people who choose to sleep rough. 
they're not there because of drug or alcohol problems. They're, we don't know really why they're there, but they don't want to be housed at this stage. Any questions? Anything else I'm meant to talk about? And that is boom, man. That is amazing. Did I cover everything I wanted you to tell? Yeah, uh, don't, don't be put off by no questions. I, I'm just thinking, my gosh, really. It might be good, though, to have one question um, to put to Anne. Um, anyone want to volunteer a question? Yeah. I'm sorry, what, what do you think in the Western world we can, need to be done, can be done? To okay, so Dom's asking how can we stop homelessness or can we stop homelessness in the Western world? Um, and this is a really interesting question and that's often what I'm called to come and talk about to groups. Homelessness, we can't get rid of completely because there are some people who don't want houses. There are some people who are in spaces in their lives where they want to be itinerants. One of the people we have who sleeps regularly at the cathedral owns property. He chooses not to live on his property. He chooses to be homeless, and I don't know why. Another person we have sleep regularly has a housing, to housing property up at Ascot, and he hates sleeping in it. He wants, he's, he's far more comfortable sleeping rough with the people he always sleeps with. Okay, but they are the exceptions. I know them really well because they're part of my life and I see them at least twice a day. The vast majority of people who are homeless are homeless because they don't have anywhere they can go. One of the big problems is that we don't have enough housing to house everybody. Okay, there isn't enough appropriate housing. A lot of people are housed at the moment. So normally we would have 15 to 20 people sleeping rough at the cathedral every night. At the moment we're having five, six, seven. But a lot of the places where people are staying are, are short term, they're not long term. They're in boarding houses where they don't feel safe. So a boarding house where you've got your own room and you share facilities with everybody else and everybody else is at the same school as you are or the same uni as you are is very different to a boarding house where you're there because it's all you can afford with people who are straight out of jail, people who are waiting to go to jail, people who live on the streets, people who randomly but frequently get high on ice. And that's where a lot of people are housed. They're actually still classified as homeless, but those are the roofs they have over their head. And for a lot of the people who are in our sector, that's the only prospect they've got in the short to medium term. So to get rid of homelessness is we actually have to build more social housing. So there's enough housing for everyone. And we have to remember to when the COVID lockdown started, the reason JobKeeper came into being was so that people could still pay rent and mortgages and wouldn't become homeless because we don't have low cost accommodation freely available for anyone. When you look at the surveys that are done every year for people on youth allowance, there is generally one or two properties in the whole of Queensland that they can afford to live in when you consider and afford to means you're paying less than 40% of your income and your rent. Okay, so the first thing is we need the houses. Secondly, we actually need to have a living wage. Even with the increases in whatever we're calling job seeker is at the moment, and I get a bit confused, the names change as soon as I'm used to one, it may still be job seeker. Um, with people are still only uh, getting about $300 a week and we know studio and one bedroom departments in most areas of Brisbane and we're not the most expensive place to live start at 320 if you're getting anything cheaper you're really lucky or there's something wrong with it and you cannot afford to pay 
80, 100, 110, 120% of your income in housing costs. It just doesn't work. You actually have to pay bills and buy food and do other things as well. We know that Scandinavia has done a really good job at providing affordable um, housing. And for them, they've had that nucleus of people. They always have some people who are homeless, but it is only a few people. And they have shown that if you house people, the drug problem, the crime problem, everything else improves as well. The reason drug addicts use so much drugs is they've got nothing else worthwhile to do. And no prospects. They are addicted, but there's nothing to make them give it up because there's no hope of anything else for most of them. So we need decent Centrelink benefits. We need a lot more housing. And we need people to vote for that. Because the reason we haven't got that is that we keep on voting for politicians who aren't going to give us that. And often because they frighten us by saying we're going to lose everything if we spend more money on people who don't deserve it, which is a load of garbage. We know if we tax the high-end people more, and I'm a high-end person. You don't have to be very wealthy to be a high-end person. You know, it makes a minimal difference taking more money off rich people. It makes a huge difference giving a bit of money to somebody who's got nothing at all. And various cities in the US have done studies seeing what happens when you house homeless people. So cities and towns will just randomly decide they're actually going to do pop-up housing. And they do it and they house all their homeless people. Their crime level goes right down. The quality of living for everybody in the town goes up. In Brisbane, between 2014 and 2017, or southeast Queensland, we spent $15 million on keeping people homeless. About $10 million of that was in police and justice costs, and five was in health costs. That was ambulances casualty attendances, admitting people to hospital, which would not have happened if they were housed. And it's fairly easy to work out, you know, and, and COVID has shown us our hospital admission rate went way down for homeless people while people were all in hotels. Crime went way down. It doesn't disappear, but it drops right down on that sort of thing. The, and it worked in all those towns. The only problem was, as soon as all the ha people were housed, the next town's people moved up the road and joined in because they wanted housing too. So it's only something you can do if the whole country is doing it at the same time. And which in our lockdowns have. Every city did it. All the big capital cities had hotel programs. What we found was that halfway through the lockdown, Bundaberg suddenly moved to Brisbane. I was suddenly seeing all these new patients who were homeless and who had moved down to Brisbane because they'd heard that everybody was being put up in hotels here. They left it a bit late, though. They came when everybody was starting to leave the hotels. Does that answer your question, Don? So we vote for the right people, OK? Thank you so much, and for your time. It's clear, obviously, that none of this is a disadvantage to you. Truly, working amongst those vulnerable is such a vocation to you. It's honestly inspiring to see such an authentically passionate person. And I'm sure I am, as well as our friends viewing this, are so grateful to have you sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Perfect.